God still has might and control, still has power in the proclaiming to the world through these prophets. I want to show you in Daniel, uh, Daniel 11, when he's asking when will be the end of these things. He's told in verse 11, from the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished, that's in the rebuilt temple during the tribulation period, the sacrifices will stop and the abomination of desolation is set up. So instead of the sacrifices, the Antichrist puts himself on the throne and is uh, claiming to be God and has everyone worship him. There will be 1,290 days. There's an extra 30 days there. Here, these prophets, they prophesy for 1,260 days. There's a 30-day difference. And in fact, this 1,290 days is unique. Where does the extra month come from? Uh, it probably comes from the lunar calendar, which has to add another month every six to seven years to make the full amount of days needed. But we're going to get back to that a little bit later. Uh, but for now, we need to ask, who are these two witnesses? Who are these two prophets? Verse 4 says, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Now, this image is, is similar to Zechariah 4, uh, where we have the two trees, olive trees, referring to the two anointed ones of uh, Zerubbabel, which is a governor uh, who's ruling over the uh, exiled people who came back to Israel, uh, who is a descendant of David. And the second one is Joshua, which is a priest leading the people uh, in the worship of God. So they were anointed by God to restore and to rebuild the temple for the nation after exile. And in Zechariah, the trees are continually producing olive oil for the lamps. And the lamps were signifying that their light does not go out, the light of the glory of God. Now, if you see the two lamps I have here, in Zechariah, it's specifically it's seven branches. Uh, this is an olive tree, but this is specifically seven branch lampstand. And in Revelation, it's hard to know whether it's the single lampstand like we saw in chapter uh, 1, 2, and 3, or if it's just like Zechariah's. And either way, the image is still conveying the same idea, that in the last days, these two will be anointed by God to restore and rebuild his spiritual temple, the people, the church uh, of God. And like the vision of Zechariah, their light, their testimony does not go out. They continually share God's word. And that is not by their, <clears throat> by their might, nor by their power, but it's by God's spirit. That's what Zechariah's message is in Zechariah 4.6. Uh, so what are these two prophets going to do? They judge the wicked. They speak against sin. They'll call for repentance by sharing the gospel. Uh, they bring true spiritual revival, and they lead and guide the people which may reflect the lampstand. So how are, these, how are prophets usually received in Scripture? Not well. Let's look how it is here. In verse 5 and 6, it says, And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, they must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the sky, so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying, and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. So first, the text says that fire came out of their mouth. Now, in Jeremiah 5.10 and 14, uh, that's used as a metaphor for judgment, for uh, prophetic statements that will judge the people. Uh, but here, it's more likely a literal sense. Uh, it recalls Elijah, who called fire down from heaven against the enemies, literally the armies that were sent to kill him in 1 Kings 18 and 2 Kings 1. But here it's not out of heaven, it's out of their mouth. So in some way, either this is literal fire that coming out of their mouth, or it's a metaphor for something as destructive as fire that occurs when they speak. Uh, why do I say that? Well, because... Number one, it says, the text says that they are devoured, which literally means to be consumed. The enemies are consumed by this fire. 
And then number two, it's repeated again that if anyone wants to harm them, they must be killed. It's necessary in order to stop them uh, because God's witnesses have to last, have to be there during the tribulation period. Uh, And number three, given what else they do, all the plagues, all the other things in the rest of this verse, it's not really a problem if fire comes out of their mouth or at their command. So let's look at the other things that they do. In uh, verse 6, it says that they have the power to shut up the sky. Well, Elijah brought drought for three and a half years in 1 Kings 17 through 18 as a plague and a judgment. Uh, They also uh, have the power to turn water into blood. Well, that's reminiscent of Moses causing the water of the Nile, which is a symbol of life for the people, to become undrinkable in Exodus 7. Which So thus it shows that that which has given them life is now a, a, what they thought was giving them life was now a symbol and reminding them that it was only producing death. And then it gives uh, the last clause to strike the earth with every plague. So it's a broader context, a broader um, description of what they're doing. And it's reminiscent of, again, Moses in Exodus 7 through 12. But it's different than Moses in the sense that these prophets do it as often as they desire. So what that communicates is that they're responding to the circumstances around them. They're responding to the the harshness, the persecution, the uh, people trying to stop them, harm them. They bring about plagues or people who reject them. The point is that all opposition against these two prophets, the witnesses of God, are futile unless God allows it. So, who are these two witnesses? Uh, There are a lot of suggestions as to who these two are. Uh, They do the same acts acts as Elijah and Moses. And we know Elijah was taken up in a chariot in 2 Kings uh, 2, so he never really died. But Moses' body was buried by God in Deuteronomy 34, so there's a little bit of mystery around his body. Jewish speculation uh, was that these two would come again at the end. Uh, let's look at that. First with Elijah. In Malachi 4, 5 says, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. So this Elijah prophet was coming back to restore the hearts of people to God and to the responsibilities of their families so that when God comes back, he doesn't have to judge them. We see this in Matthew 17, 10, uh, and this is Jesus speaking. He says, and his disciples uh, asked him, Jesus, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. Okay, that's what Malachi was saying. But I say to you that Elijah already came. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. So here, did John the Baptist restore all things? No. He came in the spirit of John, uh, of Elijah. And Luke 1.17 says it was he uh, who will go as a forerunner before him, the Christ, in the spirit and power of Elijah. So here we see these two witnesses are coming in the spirit of Elijah, calling for repentance and people to come back, and he will restore all things to Israel so that when Christ comes back, he will not smite their land with a curse, but that they will be making his way straight. Jewish Text also assumed that Moses would come back at the end. Uh, And this is based on Deuteronomy 18.5, where the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. Uh, John 1.25, it says, They asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing? This is the Pharisees asking John, uh, Why are you then baptizing if you are not the Christ? nor Elijah, nor the prophet, the expected prophet, the second Moses. Uh, Notice three categories. 
in John 6, 14, therefore, when the people saw the sign which Jesus had performed, he multiplied the food and the fish for the people, just like Moses did. He provided food for them. They said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world, meaning that second Moses. And Matthew 17, 3, at the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter said, and behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him, talking with Jesus. So we have, over and over again, references to the kingdom to the end and Moses and Elijah. So, back to our question. Who are these two witnesses? Well, they're two future prophets who come in the spirit of Elijah and Moses, do a lot of the same things that they did. Uh, And they're carrying out their miraculous works, uh, their missions of judgment, and restoring God's people. How do you think the world responds to their ministry? In verses 7 through 10, we read that the prophets are hated. We read about the hatred for these prophets. Let's start in verse 7. It says, When they had finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. Now, notice it says, when they finish their testimony, this is their goal, this is their point in life, their purpose. The testimony is a personal witness in life and words of Jesus. Literally, the word for testimony is martyria, which we get our English word for martyr. Uh, and it's, it communicates the idea of someone's believing something so strongly that they're willing to die for it. And here we see the beast, which we learn later is the Antichrist. Uh, and he is from and thus doing the will of hell. Uh, that which is separate from God. Uh, and notice, it, John is identifying him as the beast that comes out of the abyss. Now, we're not introduced to that at all, yet, anywhere. Uh, it's not until John gets to chapter 13 that he sees him, uh, which communicates and, and identifies for us that John is writing this book later. He sees the vision, maybe even taking notes, but he doesn't fully edit it till later. Because this information is out of sequence. Okay, so this, it's the same beast that's going to come up out of the abyss, which I'm going to talk about in chapter 13, John's saying. Uh, he's going to make war with them and overcome them and kill them. Uh, you might say, well, make war with two guys? Well, yes, they're going to try to kill them, uh, the two prophets. That same word, the same idea. Uh, idea, metaphor of waging war is used uh, of, of Elijah, where armies are sent against him to kill him, to make war with him. And that's where he brings fire from heaven. So after their mission is done, God allows them to be killed. And they're killed? If they're killed, what's the message that that sends to people? Well, in verse 8 through 10, it says, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, uh, where also their Lord was crucified. Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in the tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate. And they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Okay, the beast kills them. And they're in the streets of the great city. That's referring to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem here, because remember, it's given over to the Gentiles at this time, uh, to those who are not in a covenant relationship with, with God. They're called, proverbially, they're called Sodom, which is known for its wickedness, its rebellion and gross sin. And, proverbially, it's known as Egypt, which is a place of oppression and slavery of God's people. And, thirdly, it's identified as the place that had crucified their Lord. It's communicating the idea that just like they rejected Christ and crucified him, killed him, the witness of God, the very revelation of God in Jerusalem, they're going to do the same thing to these two prophets. So notice all people see them. 
the two prophets, their dead bodies. They're put on display to show the strength of the Antichrist. And thus, the Antichrist is doing this in order to convert all to worship him, uh, to show him, uh, to show the world that he is more powerful than these two. Uh, and remember, this is uh, in chapter 10, verse 11, that John had to prophesy concerning all peoples, tribes, and nations, and tongues, and here it is. Uh, he's prophesying about them. Notice they're, they're not allowed to be buried, to be placed in the tomb. That's an extreme dishonor given to people who are hated. It's actually forbidden by God in Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 through 23. Uh, and as a, a side note, the two prophets, these two prophets' witnesses that are coming, they know this chapter in Revelation, and yet they remain faithful. Could you imagine if you knew this was going to happen to you? Uh, this was coming, uh, and yet they still fulfill God's purposes and plans. Uh, so it shows great bravery and great faith. But the, going back to the text, these people rejoice. Why do they rejoice? Because the light and voice of God, which was convicting them and tormenting them, both physically in the plagues and spiritually of their sin, is stopped. They openly and publicly rejoice and celebrate the seemingly defeat of the prophets of God. Does God's word work usually end in death? Is that the end? No. Rather, God brings life from death. Verses 11 through 13. Let's read the whole passage. It says, But after the three and a half days, the breath of of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and a great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. Then they went up into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched. And in that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell, and 7,000 people were killed in, in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Okay, three and a half days. Now, usually in an ancient culture, after three days, it communicated that the spirit had permanently left the body. Why? Because in three days, the body would start to decay. body would start to smell. It was no longer good. So the information, the connotation there of three and a half days is that these two prophets were undeniably dead. And... What happens? God gives them life. This is the breath of life from God. So who gives all men their life? Well, it's God. God does. God gives us our very breath to live and exist right now. Realizing that you don't even have your own breath, the ability to have life in you, it, it puts a, a humble humbleness into us realizing that we are the creation that's dependent on the Creator for our sustained life, for continuing, for breath, for this second of life. It reminds us of our, our position and our place before our God. So people from around the world had seen them, seen them die, and they knew their message and the plagues and their testimony for Jesus. They, now they see God brought them back to life from the dead. This act is a greater testimony of the truth of their message and the promise of God. And that's not all. God's voice calls them home. God gives them a special honor. He bestows a special honor on these two witnesses. They go up into heaven, in a, into a cloud, just like Jesus ascended. Showing their full acceptance and going up into heaven to be with God. But wait, there's more. Just like after the crucifixion of Jesus, when God showed his anger with a great earthquake, so also here. There's a great earthquake showing the displeasure of God at the rejection of his two prophets. And many people die. A tenth of the city falls, uh, and it says that 7,000 people were killed. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that the city had 70,000 people, uh, because it, 
It could be more, it could be less. Today in Jerusalem, there's upwards of 8 million people. Now, a lot has happened since, so their population could be much lower, but it could be more or it could be less. The point is that 7,000, a large number, was killed. And then it says, in the rest, which is again hyperbolic language, is showing that a large number of them, a majority of them that were left over, feared and gave glory to, God of, to the God of heaven. Now notice this is the God of heaven in contrast to the Antichrist who is on earth, who has power and is given authority for those 42 months on earth. So, fear and gave glory to God. Does that mean that they were saved? Look at the language of Revelation 14, 6 through 7. And I saw another angel flying in midheaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. So what was the eternal gospel preached by this angel? Fear God and give, give him glory. Look at Revelation 16, 9. Uh, men who were scorched by the fierce heat of the fourth bowl, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has the power over these plagues, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. So, yes, having a proper realization of who God is brings fear, reverence, awe, as your place as a creation, which then results in giving your life to him for his glory. And that is a proper life in relationship to one's creator. So the message of the gospel was planted by these two prophets, but only brought about life when they had left the earth. Specifically, in this case here, to these people, it brought about a great revival, probably more than the rest of their lives. Notice that they follow a pattern of Christ. Christ lived a life serving God and sharing the gospel. He was rejected by the authorities in Israel, in Jerusalem specifically, and died in Jerusalem. And he also ascended and and resurrected and ascended. And through that, many turned to God. We see the same pattern here. So God uses these two prophetic witnesses to restore and rebuild the temple of his people. So, when I put that God brings life from death, he brought life to the two prophetic witnesses, the two martyrs. He also brought life to many who had heard their message and saw the resurrection and God's confirmation of their message and who had repented, who had feared God and gave him glory, gave their lives over to him. The final section puts this vision into a greater context by stating the conclusion of the second woe, verse 14. The text says, the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. So again, we see here, there's a chronology of these visions and judgments in Revelation. Here, we see the reason for the 30-day cap. They do not prophesy for the full 42 months because they're killed as part of their testimony, which has a great result of salvation to many, the rest that are there. But there's one more woe to come, which is the seventh trumpet. And the events of the seventh trumpet, which consist of the seven bowls of God's wrath, will occur within the span of those final 30 days. And the intensity of the bowls will demand that the time period be extremely brief. And we will get there in a few chapters. Next week, we will see what happens when the seventh trumpet sounds. So let's go over some of the major points and applications. Number one, God's people are secure in their relationship with God through the sacrifice of Jesus. That relationship is owned and safeguarded by God. We can find and have rest in Him. It's His work. We are His possession. 
We are bought and owned by him, and that is our one comfort in life and in death. Number two, it isn't the plan of God to give the Antichrist limited authority, which will seem like victory, but his days are numbered. We can look all around us and see the wicked prosper, or bad men become rulers, or injustices, various things like this. We have to realize that their days are numbered, and God is in control, and he will bring about a greater good and a greater glory through them. Number three, the prophets of God, they wore sackcloth, signify that God and they mourned over sin. We as God's people, likewise, should have this attitude towards the sinful world. We live all around us, uh, knowing the sadness and the grief that they will be eternally judged if they don't turn or they're not continually continue in their deception and the lie and choosing to believe a lie rather than the truth of God. We need to thus look at them with compassion and, and pity and realize uh, that what would we not give in order for them to gain eternity? Number four, although sin and destruction are rampant in this period, God makes his presence and truth known throughout the world in his servants, the two prophets. And until that time, we are God's witnesses on earth, giving our lives and sharing his truth. Uh, we have a great opportunity in ministry to speak to those who are around us and to share God's words of grace and mercy both in our, our lives and our words to the people in whom he brings into contact with us. Number five, God's prophets are characterized as God's messengers who point out sin, call for repentance, and are instruct, uh, and, uh, instructions of God's miraculous judgment upon people who do not receive their message of hope. Prophets are usually not messengers of blessing, not focused on meeting earthly needs, or people who are creating a safe environment for the lost to feel welcome. Uh, the greatest and most important issue is not social needs. It's not comfort. It's not welcoming. It's the gospel. It's a response to the gospel. Sharing that people have a great need and we have a great God who has provided. Number six, God gives everything that has life its breath. We owe our very life and breath today to him which should cause us to be humble and to be thankful. And number seven, God's two prophets are so hated by society that the world celebrates their death. Even in the face of ex this extreme rejection, they obediently share God's message. And, they br and God brings life to those seeds that were planted after their death and resurrection, which lead to eternal salvation of many. I put this in because we need to realize that when we share the gospel and someone rejects us, spits on our face, calls us all kinds of names, doesn't want to be our friend anymore, we don't know what God can do with those words, those messages. Just like these prophets here, it planted seeds that God later uh, convicted and worked in their heart and turned them. And they knew the message of the truth because of the prophets. So too with us. If we share the gospel, it may be rejected. We may be rejected. Uh, but we never know what effect God will have. The point is to be faithful and to uh, share the truth. We are not to try to be offensive, uh, but the gospel message itself is offensive. We're supposed to be at peace with all men. And number eight, a life born again through the gospel of Jesus is characterized by having a healthy fear of the reality of God and by giving one's life to display God's glory. We, as believers, need to live a life that truly sees God for who He is, to be fearful of Him and in awe and reverence, bowing before Him, and to use the life that He's given us to obediently reflect and glorify His character and His nature uh, through the power of His Spirit in our lives. And that's the conclusion of Revelation 11, 1 through 13, the temple and the two witnesses.